Hi, this is Mark Arnold with a special edition of the Fun Ideas podcast because we have our special guest, Charles F. Grosnay, and he has some urgent events and a new book to promote. So we're doing this uh, quickly so we can get it up before uh, the weekend. So welcome to the show. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Great to be back on Fun Ideas podcast. All right. So what do you want to talk about first, your new book or the Fab Four Music Festival? I want to talk about the haunted pooch that is uh, uh, coming to our picture here. <laughs> haunted pooch. <laughs> can you hear? Yeah, she can hear. It's she. She, she, yeah. Uh, she's not reacting. But, you know, she, right. she doesn't react too much to, to visuals. The other dog, if there's a dog on TV, oh, she goes nuts so. And I go, it's just a dog on TV. It could be, and it's really funny when I'm watching like some old movie or TV show from like the 40s. And it's like, you know, these dogs have been long dead for decades, you know? And then she's like, anyway. Well, yeah, we got a lot of cool things coming up. The last time you and I spoke, I think I was really, really pushing the book of top 10 horror lists from all oh see it blurs right it blurs if you have the blurry background and yeah. i don't have a copy in front of me to the two i only have a dog <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. that disappears so, um, <laughs> got great 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 as you know we got great uh, amazon reviews for that and i owe you one we got um uh, a lot of nice sales the bear manor media release of book of top 10 horror lists um but what i did uh recently is i produced a paranormal convention in Connecticut, Paracon 2, which thank goodness was very successful as well. Um, but what's really cool about it is I launched a new book, True Ghost Stories of Connecticut. And if we look at your background, it even has the middle of the book where it says, firsthand paranormal accounts <laughs> by individuals who experience the occurrences. So what I did, Mark, which was really cool is um, launched the book at this convention where some of the contributors of to the book, like I got all these great paranormal people, these psychics, clairvoyants, readers, and just everyday people to contribute chapters, which indeed were their scariest or most unbelievable or most like, wow. These were, when, when I ask what experience ghost hunting paranormal comes to mind first, this is the stories they gave us or me, and this is in the book. So these people were at the convention. So if you're a collector and you're a fan and you're a pop culture nerd like me, not only do you come over to Charles Rosenay and ask for an autograph, but you can also get the autograph, which people did from the amazing Kreskin who wrote the forward uh, and from a lot of the contributors to the book who had chapters in it, who happen to be vendors or special guests or guest speakers at this convention. So it's kind of like a once in a lifetime, you know, opportunity. And that was very exciting and it did really well. And we brought a slew of books uh, to the convention and only came home with about 11 of them. Oh, so wow. that was, that was, yeah, that was pretty great. And um, you know, the reception has been phenomenal. People who are in the book, are just like, uh, oh, wow, this is amazing. And they're buying, can we buy 10 copies to give to relatives, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it, we, we hit we hit on a, a nice one here. It's the ghost, it's true ghost stories of Connecticut. It's available through Amazon, but most of the people who are listening to your podcast or know me or you know are familiar with it know that they can get obviously a signed copy through me and the website is www.paranormalconnecticut.com for this particular book or uh, find me on Facebook or just, you know, yell out Charles and the, the, spirit, the spirits will get me and connect me with you. So we'll be able to hook you up with a book, but it's a fun read. It's really, really amazing stories that have never been collected before. You know, Mark, there've been other in every town, in every city, in every village, in every state, there's mm -hmm. the, you know, the ghost stories of Phoenix, the ghost stories of this place, that place. And it's really the legends. It's the, how these places became haunted or why there's a lore about them. Well, this took it one step further. This is actually more unique than those in that it's the firsthand, you know, experiences of people who visited these places. Now, some of these places, if you're from Connecticut or New England or the New York area, you've heard of them. You know, some of them are famous 
because they're haunted, but others are residences where these things happened or uh, someone's business where this unexplained occurrence happened. So it's, it's really people who are uh, reading it are really loving it. Cool. Now you, you had me help you proofread it. So I got to read it. <laughs> yeah. And, but I never really asked you questions about it. So I actually have a few questions based on yeah. what I read. So, I mean, it's like, how, what inspired you to start collecting these stories or have you just done that for years just as a like a sideline and then oh i got like 20 30 stories maybe i can make a book out of this no no unlike the book of top 10 horror lists where i had accumulated so many lists prior to and then decided hey i've got these lists i might as well do a book this was the other way around i had a uh, you know, gotten very much involved with paranormal investigations. Mm -hmm. And I produced the Paracon last year. And I thought, you know, wait a second. I tell everyone I'm a skeptic. I tell everyone I'm a non-believer, but yet I've had amazing things happen that are unexplainable. Uh, one I, I put in the book called The Pink Lady, which happened when I was in college and visited this area where I actually saw an apparition and unexplained and went back with my parents and had the same experience, brought friends back and had the same experience. So I didn't even think of this until, you know, college to now. It, I'd forgotten and didn't even realize, whoa, this was an amazing story. This is something I'd like to put in the book. And then I thought, well, I'm in touch now with all these people who are part of the paranormal world. And I reached out to a lot, a lot of them said, oh yeah, I have great stories, but they happened in upstate New York or this happened in you know, uh, Rhode Island. I said, no, it's gotta be Connecticut. So that was <laughs> the barometer that I wanted it really very, very uh, territorially um, distinct for Connecticut. And they gave me these, these stories and I went through them and I said, well, this fits, this is great. There's gotta be in the book. Um, and what I did is I, I rewrote a few of them because some of the people who wrote it, you know, might have been very simplistic in their writing or didn't have, you know, quite the correct grammar or yeah. punctuation that we do. So I edited every story, made sure it made sense, and then went back to the author and said, please read this and please make sure that this is accurate. And I want you to testify that this really, truly happened. I did not want to put anything in the book that someone made up or that was just hearsay or some legend that they heard and passed down. It had to be true experiences and true ghost stories from these people. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, it took about eight or nine months of, um, you know, getting people to put it, uh, to give me their stories, to rewrite them, to add photos to the, to the uh, stories. And after you put out one book, it seems like the second one comes a little quicker. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you hear about these recording artists, if you're a rock star and you spend, you know, 30 years of your life coming up with that amazing album, and then the record company says, hey, you've got four months, give us the, the sequel to it. It's a little tougher. Not so much when you're compiling and putting out books, because now you have the flow, you have the feel, you know which direction it's going to go. And it's not like I'm writing, you know, 100, 200, 300 pages myself. Yes, I'm editing it. Yes, I'm adding photos to it. Yes, I'm making sure it's great. But it's still a, a lot of people contributing to it. And that makes it a little, a little, I want to say easier, but it makes it a little smoother for releasing. And on this book, uh, it was the first time I, I did my own uh, publishing. I, I published it myself through through um, um, a custom label called Kiwi Publishing and uh, through Amazon. And what was great about it is I kind of finished it a month before the convention. As you know, you did a proofread. Uh, a few other of my close um, colleagues did a proofread and uh, very happy with it, put it out and got it in time a week before the convention, literally. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just perfect timing. So very excited. True Ghost Stories of Connecticut uh, available through Amazon. Right. Now, you also said when we're, you know, earlier when you're talking about it, is that uh, some of these are like well-known legends or stories or tales or whatever you want to call them yeah. uh abnormal accounts like it says behind me um, uh did you request anybody to write a specific one like if you knew ahead of time saying hey write about this or did you know any experts of a particular uh place that you kind of nudged them to say come on write me a story about this that's a really good question so some of them might have been like there's a gentleman by the name of bill hall who wrote the book the world's 
uh, scariest, most haunted house, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, about, about a place on Lindley Street in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And um, he specifically did not write on his expertise. He did uh, something, uh, uh, Phantom Messages, and I'm so glad he did because the story is just unbelievable, his contribution. But no, I left it up to each individual because what their expertise is, or their maybe they know this place, maybe this they know this sanitarium better than any other place, that might have not been their best or most amazing experience. They might have had that most amazing experience in a barn somewhere or you know or or in an open field so um yeah uh they had their choice it was up to them what they wrote and um there was the only in fact when i sent them out you know perspective and say please do a story i said i don't care how long it is how short it is or how bad your grammar is i just want it to be a great story and i want it to be true those that was the and it had to be connecticut that was pretty yeah. much the boundaries and the boards I gave to the to the folks. Now, some uh, wrote about very famous places in Connecticut, like Dudley Town, um, Fairfield Woods, the the sanitarium, and um, some the ones uh, I had my own story about Dudley Town. So I added a chapter to what was already there. So there was Dudley Town plus mine. Someone else wrote about like all, there's a place called the Valley in Connecticut and encompasses a bunch of towns and cities and villages, which are very haunted. I have a partner, Nick Roseman, who says, it's the, it's the Connecticut Triangle, the Valley. And uh, so in within that area, there's, several opera houses, there's theaters, there's a, a whole lot of areas that are very scary and very haunted. So somebody wrote an overview of pretty much all those places, which included the Sterling Opera House in Derby, Connecticut. Um, somebody else specifically wrote their experience about the Sterling Opera House in Connecticut. So there's two chapters. One is the overview of the area, which included that, plus their story and then somebody else who really went into great detail about the sterling opera house in derby connecticut and that one comes to mind and i'll tell you why i have a dear friend um, by the name of richard felix who used to be uh, one of the presenters on, a, on the british tv show um most haunted mm. and whenever I, whenever i do ghost tours to england richard felix is my co-host I'm, I'm the one who makes sure everyone has fun He's the one who makes sure they get to all the places, the right places with the right stories and the scariest uh, haunted places in England. Well, Richard is from Derby, England, D-E-R-B-Y. And Sonia, where I had my paranormal convention, is one town over from Derby, Connecticut, D-E-R-B-Y. Uh, Richard Felix came to America to promote his book, What is a Ghost? And he wanted to visit a Darby in America. And I said, you mean Derby? He goes, no, Darby. He runs the Darby Gowls, which is the Derby jail house <laughs> in Derby, England, which is Darby. I'm going to keep going back and forth with this. That's fine. And long story short, when we brought him to Connecticut, he visited the uh, Sterling Opera House in Darby. And it come, come to, um, which I didn't know, uh, Mark, and this is really interesting. All these towns had a big hotel they would have a big fancy restaurant and they would have a big opera house, which is their version of a movie house, a theater, a burlesque house. Why? Because it was on the train line. Mm -hmm. So that if Houdini was touring, he would jump on the train. He would go to Ansonia, Connecticut, do one night at the opera house, spend the night at the big you know saloon hotel get on the train the next day and go to the next town and th that would be his tour and someone from town to town it wasn't like now where you say oh it's the happy together tour it's playing these 20 dates you didn't know that you just heard oh my god uh houdini's in town tonight not knowing that he's tomorrow night he's one town over in those <laughs> days there was never that network right. so every one of these towns had uh opera houses where there was rarely opera. <laughs> it was usually burlesque and concerts and it was a gathering social halls. It served multi-purposes. Yeah. And when they closed down because there was so many other things to do, 
uh, you know, they went into, most of the time they would go into decay, but people who had great times there, uh, if you're to believe the uh, supernatural, uh, people whose spirits move on, but don't move on completely, perhaps, uh, to gravitate to go to places where they were, if it's a negative thing, where they were tormented and have to get over that, or which is more common and they had happy lives, they go to the places where they were happiest and that's their homes with loved ones or places like, you know, like gathering halls and, 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 um, and movie theaters and, uh, and, and opera houses. So it, it all makes sense. So there's a couple of opera houses in here. There's a couple of um, actual scary uh, outdoor places a ton of places that are hospitals and sanitariums and you know the usual suspects for haunted places and even a bunch of private residences and some of the best stories are in those private residences now how did you get it's probably because of your connections of, of course but how did you get uh, Kreskin to write your forward <laughs> <laughs> Kreskin's been a friend for many years. I, uh, <laughs> I booked him onto a bunch of things through the years. He came with me on a promotion in Puerto Rico once mm -hmm. in 2014 when I had the Beatles 50th anniversary event in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had like 20, 30 acts. We had a bunch of presenters who just they came on stage and introduced the next act. And I invited Kreskin. He was really honored. So when, <laughs> when I published the book of top 10 horror lists, and I was almost done. I said, well, maybe I'll ask Kreskin for a list. You know, I don't know if he's still, you know, got all his facilities with him, if he still can write. And he gave me an amazingly great list for the book of top 10 horror lists. So when I told him, you know, Mark, when you think of, um, we just mentioned him, when you think of magic, you think of Houdini. When you think of the paranormal nowadays, you think of the Warrens because of the Conjuring movies and all that. But when you think of mentalism, you think of Kreskin. I mean, he was the first and still the greatest. And the connection between the paranormal and the unknown and the mentalism and the mind reading, you know, it's reading. You know, people who go to the conventions have their uh, palms read. They have crystals read. They have tarot card readings, a lot of reading. So um, a mind reader is connected in the same way. And that's what Kreskin, aside from being a master magician, I mean, that's what he's known for. So I thought, you know, I'm going to ask Richard Felix, my friend from Derby, Derby, England, and I'm going to ask uh, Kreskin to see if they'll who will come up with a forward for it. Mm -hmm. Richard Felix came up with it too late. And Kreskin came up with it like instantly. Mm -hmm. And in his forward, he tells the story of his great paranormal uh, experience, unexplained experience where he got up late and uh, was, was due to get on a plane and needed to get to an appearance. And for some reason, he always went to the airport the same way he took a different route. Hmm. And he got there late. And he went to the front desk and dilly dallied. And they said, all right, of course, you're, you know, you, you, you're who you are. Don't worry about in those days. There was no TSA. There wasn't big security. Go ahead. You'll make the plane. And he schmoozed a little and did not make the plane. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, his, his, um, his luggage made it and his luggage came back to him. And along with a lot of dead bodies because that plane crashed. Ooh. And he tells that story in his foreword. Yeah. And to this day, he can't explain why he uh, got up a little later, why he took a different route, a wrong route, mm -hmm. why he dilly dallied at the front desk. Um, but he said there were greater powers that are unexplained. And he tells that story. And he gave me just a great forward. And he ended it with, if you like this book, also get the book of top 10 horrorless so he's sharp and we had him at the convention and uh he was just with us at the paranormal at the paracon mm -hmm. and my gosh he, he was just unbelievable it's like when tony bennett his best comparison is you know tony bennett had a, a very hard of hearing mm -hmm. and he was not 100 percent with it uh, but we got on stage and click you know he would go right into i left my heart in and he was perfect he was great and the same with kreskin you know got him on stage it was a little shaky and we're like uh-oh and then when he got into his zone it was like pew, 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 wow magic tricks me and mind reading was unbelievable like it was back on johnny carson in the 60s it was amazing cool <laughs>
And I guess the inevitable question is there going to be another book maybe on England you mentioned or somewhere other place or even if there's ones left over for Connecticut. So there's a bunch that did not make it into the book. Yeah. And then there was a bunch of people who were at the convention that we just had saying, oh, I would have given you a, you know, an article. So yeah, I think we'll do a part two, uh, volume two of True Ghost Stories of Connecticut uh, someday, eventually. I have other projects that are ahead of that, as you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, it's, you know, one of those things that I think that we'll get to someday and maybe perhaps a true ghost stories of New England, if we could spread it out a little more, because I already have some great stories of Massachusetts and Rhode Island that would fit the bill, but I didn't want to put it in the Connecticut book yet. Yeah, I think, you know, if something's successful and it's fun, you, you always want to do a, a follow up to it. My book of top 10 horror lists, I'm about a third of the way through uh, getting more you know, contributions from celebrities. Uh, so we're going to eventually see Bride of uh, the book of top 10 horror lists. As you know, I'm working on the book of top 10 Beatle lists where celebrities are giving me their lists. So we got those in the works. And yeah, that's a, I think we'll see eventually someday a follow up to True Ghost Stories of Connecticut. Cool. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I, I was just trying to think, you know, who, who else you could consult like work along with like Ripley's Believe It or Not or something like that, you know, in tandem with them. If they some, of these, some of these stories yeah. could have been in Ripley's Believe It or Not yeah. because some of them are just too like unbelievable to believe, but they're true. And that's all, that is exactly what Ripley's Believe It or Not was. Yeah, and of course they had that long running comic book series that actually was called True Ghost Stories. So yeah. I used to buy that all the time in the day, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else to plug about that? Or do you want to move over to the Fab Four Music Festival? It's <laughs> well, yeah, you know, just for timing reasons, um, uh, just a few weeks away. I don't know when this is going to air, but the well, August... I can put it up tonight. So it's like, oh, yeah, or tomorrow. Yeah. So, so we will share this immediately. August 6th. Yeah. Uh, is, is um, jumping from the the unexplained and the paranormal and the supernatural to the rock and roll and the fun of the Beatles. <laughs> you know, for many years, I produced uh, Beatle conventions yeah. and those morphed into the Beatle festivals. And they have one in, uh, in, in um, where is it? Uh, is it this weekend in, in North Carolina called Fab Fest? Mm -hmm. And then there's one in uh, Louisville, Kentucky every May called Abbey Road on the River. And as you know, I've been bringing fans to Liverpool forever since 1983 for the Beatles Festival there. And those are all more than conventions. They're festivals where it's multi-band mm -hmm. and it's outdoors and it's a whole different vibe. And that's pretty much what Fab Four Music Festival is. It's 10 bands, mm -hmm. it's some vendors, uh, it might be surprise guests, but it's also food trucks and fun and it's outdoors. So it's a little different vibe. But what's great is it's so many different bands and none of them play the same songs. Right. That's been my little, as you know, my little shtick. Uh, yes. you, you, can, you can play every song that some other band isn't because I don't want every band ending with Twist and Shout or Long Tall yeah, Sound. That's right. <laughs> we got to mix it up. You know, every I've young band. I've already heard this 10 times today. <laughs> right. Every young band wants to do Come Together. No, no, no. The first <laughs> band that picks it and claims it, they're doing it. Mm. But what's really cool this year is it's like a real good mix of Beatle classics, solo stuff. Uh, obscurities hits <laughs> and two of the bands are playing non-Beatles we've got one monkeys band I was gonna ask you that <laughs> and one band doing all bad finger we got bad finger oh, yeah, I saw the bad finger one you know so of course it's it's Beatle related. <laughs> it's the name of uh the first you know their first jam bad finger boogie so yeah bad finger cover band and the monkeys cover band zilch and they're both playing as part of the Fab Four Music Festival. August 6th, which is a Saturday, it's from noon to 8 p.m. And it's at a brand new venue, which I visited about a week or two ago and ugh, just perfect for this. This is like the ideal place. It might be the best place we've ever had it. Mm, aside from the Oakdale, aside from Ives. No, anyway, it's a <laughs> great venue and it's um, in Simsbury, Connecticut, which is a little further north 
closer to Massachusetts in the Hartford area and the airports there. Um, so if you're coming from New York or New Jersey or places south, yeah, you're going to travel another half hour, an hour, but it's more convenient for the rest of New England. And the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center, uh, you know, the people who work there are just so wonderful and so welcoming. And it's, we're really excited about the event. Cool. And I know we had the same discussion last year when you did this. Um, any sim same bands or are they completely different than last year? Yeah, so it's a mix. You know, people want some of the same bands. Right. And then there's one band that is it never fails. They're my headliner. So, you know, they're, they're going to come back every year. And that's the Hoffners. Um, it's uh, Mike Strito on drums. Dane is the, the McCartney. And they're great. And they're the dress-up band. They're the ones that we call the Boots and Suits and Wigs band because they look the part, they dress the part, they sound the part, they've got all the right instruments and um, they always close the show. And uh, that's the that's how it's been from the first time we did it. And that's how it's always gonna be, uh, hopefully um, with, them, with them closing. But another band has kind of sneaked into that role of almost being the headliner. Uh, they were there last year and they, they stole the show there kind of the opposite of the um, Hoffners in that they don't, uh, you know, they wear skinny ties and wear white shirts and they kind of dress the part, but they're not wearing wigs and they're not trying to look like it, but they've got the energy and they're a little younger and they're called the Black Ties. Oh. And you and I know them through that Natalie. Is, yeah. Right. And they're, and they're at this show and they've been doing a lot of the festivals. So in it's kind of in descending order of, who closes the show, the Hoffners. Before them, it's the Black Ties. And then uh, prior to that, it's a rockin' band called Double the Dial. And Double the Dial has been there before, they're returning. And they've, uh, they're have they a good mix of Beatles and solo stuff. Mm -hmm. Prior to them is the Monkees band we talked about, and that's Zilch. They're from Rhode Island and they play some of the monkey hits, but they go a little deeper too. So if you're a true monkeys fan, you might be surprised at the, what they're going to play. Um, and then if you're just, you know, a casual monkeys fan and expect all the hits, you're going to say, Oh, why didn't they play such and such? Uh, but before, uh, Zilt, before, Zilt, <laughs> before Zilch goes on, it's the Navels, uh, not, you know, your typical name for a, a band that does Beatles, but it's because they don't just do Beatles. They do, not at our show, when they're out, you know, they do Fleetwood Mac and they do a whole lot of great stuff. They have a female lead singer and her name's Laurie and they rock. She's amazing. And when they do Oh Darling, the house just, just it brings the house down. Um, so we're really excited because it's, they're one of three bands that have a female singer. And that's the first time that that's happened. The band that goes on just before them is called Take Two and Call Me in the Morning. <laughs> and they're, uh, I think, a six piece. So they're the largest number of the bands. Uh, they have a female in it, John Maniello, who's a good friend of mine, huge Beatle fan, uh, um, said, Charles, he wanted to play this year. He hadn't played in a bunch of years. So we brought them back. One of the new acts that's on the bill is my friend uh, Foggy Otis is a ukulele maestro. Hmm. And he was putting together a band with a set of uke inspired stuff. And uh, we just came up with the name from me to uke. <laughs> and, uh, and we're looking forward to that. He's a first timer. The other first timer is playing right before him and they're called Day Trippers. They're from New York. I love their logo. Uh, you know, the guy who um, is Michael, who's part of the band, who's the leader of the band, who, you know, said, you got to have us and talk me into having them. Uh, I kind of booked them based on their graphics. I love the, ca the cartoons and the great stuff they come up with. And if you see, <laughs> if you go to the Fab Four website, which is www.fab4, the number four, fab4musicfestival.com. And you look at the thumbnails of each of the band, their images, uh, it shows the four Beatle cartoon uh, guys from the uh, Al Brodax, from the original Beatle cartoons with a gal in the middle. So I really just <laughs> absolutely love their logo. And the other band that's playing, uh, that's never played before is the Bad, Bad Finger Boogie, Bad Finger Band. Mm -hmm. My friend Jeremy and his crew are going to be doing all the Bad Finger hits, plus a few surprises. And we just added the 10th band 
who hadn't been on the bill because we were keeping that set open in the hopes that they could join us. They hadn't been with us in a while. They're about three hours away. They're from all parts of uh, New York and Ulster County and Sullivan County and Poughkeepsie and all that area. And it's Pat Horgan and Thunder Road Band. And you hear Thunder Road, you might think Springsteen, but they're just the most amazing rocking band. And they're gonna be playing uh, stuff like While My Guitar Gently Weeps and uh, the No-No song. So they're all over the place. <laughs> and they said, Charles, you know, we see you got a, a bad finger band and you got a, a monkeys band. Can we do one non beatles song? And I said, well, it's gotta be British Invasion. I thought, well, they might do Hermits or they might do Dave Clark. They do it a Rolling Stones song. So that's OK. That fits the bill. And there's your 10 acts uh, along with me emceeing the day. It will have a lot of fun. Uh, now, this year, was it like easier to get the bands because it's like the COVID and pandemics kind of it's kind of iffy. But, you know, it's like it seems like it's a little bit easier to get around and you know see things and stuff like that i'm going to a few concerts later this year and stuff like that and doing some shows so yeah well we did it we did it we did it last year right and people were a lot more reluctant to go out because of covid but because it's an outdoor open field you can sit 20 feet away from someone you're not right. really coming close to anybody uh, unless you're you know going up and buying food from the food trucks or buying some drinks um so it wasn't an issue last year with the fans, and it certainly wasn't an issue with the bands because, my gosh, I can tell you, Mark, another 10 bands would have played, you know, <laughs> get that many bands that want to be part of it, you know, because they spend the day with their family, they come, they buy Be Beatles memorabilia from the vendors, they walk around, they see the other bands, it's a, it's a fraternity, it's a community, so they come early and they spend the whole day, if they're playing late, if they're playing early, they come early, they play and they spend the whole day. Cool. And it's a, a fun gig because it's kind of a half hour on and then 15 minutes off and then it's the next band. So it's not like they're doing, you know, three hour sets in a club where nobody appreciates them. They're playing in front of Beatle fans. So it's for the, for the groups, it's, it's, they, they just love doing it and they clamor to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And I know you, like you said, it's strictly timed. I know. So somebody can't go on for a two hour jam or something, do some Grateful Dead thing. You're like, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. You got 30 minutes. I have to see your set to A, make sure that you're not repeating something that someone else is doing right. and B, that it clocks in at under the half hour. <laughs> you know, if I see Helter Skelter and Hey Jude, I'm going to say, oh, that's it. You guys are done. That's it. <laughs> Revolution number nine. Number nine. You're done. <laughs> <All right. laughs> number nine. I'm waiting for the band that does Revolution Number Nine. <laughs> hey Jude, you know my name. Look up my number. That's it. Or what's right, the right. New, what's the new Mary Jane? There you go. Or I want <laughs> you. She's so heavy. It's pretty long too. Well, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anything else to promote? You're the promoting fool, as we all know. <laughs> like... we'll, we'll save everything else to the next show. I just want if you're you know what if you're on the East Coast spend the day with us, come out even for an hour or three hours or all the whole day from noon to eight. It's fabformusicfestival.com at the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center. You're going to fall in love with this place. It's just so beautiful in the middle of, you know, a small city, not far from Hartford, Connecticut. Um, just enjoy the bands and visit all the vendors. We got a lot of great vendors. You know, it's not like a, a convention where you have 50, you know, 60 tables. It's 10, 12 great vendors. Uh, most of them are Beatles stuff, but there'll be other things too. There'll be crafts, there'll be artisans. There'll, uh, there's a beef jerky guy, you know, there'll give you a little bit of everything. <laughs> and, uh, and of course the food and the drinks. And it's a great atmosphere for the family. You know, I always love the fact that when we started this, uh, I started doing the conventions when I was in, in, in high school and the people were my age. You come into the conventions, you know, 20, maybe 30 year olds. Um, and then and before I turned around, it was folks in their 40s and 50s bringing their kids to the conventions. Well, now it's multi-generations, it's grandparents, with their kids, with their kids, you know, the grandchildren, and it's the kids playing frisbee in the field while the grown-ups 
are dancing to the to the grandchildren to it's just <laughs> it's just a great feeling and hopefully i'm contributing my little bit to keeping the spirit of the beatles music alive they don't need my help <laughs> but i'd like to think that you know in the, all these years that i've been doing it that it's contributed and 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 helped kept that uh kept that going in some tiny tiny minuscule form yeah <laughs> Well, I'm impressed because of the Bad Finger group, to be honest, because it's like, yeah. I've seen the real Bad Finger, at least jo Joey Molland, you know, sure. but, but uh, you know, it's like, he's not going to tour forever. He's not going to be around forever. And, you know, it's the same thing, even with the monkeys, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're down to Mickey, you know, and so it's like, and, you know, even the Beatles down to two. So it's like, you know, they're not going to be around forever. Uh, you might as well see some good bands that can competently play and actually uh, admire these guys and can do it right so yeah. it's all about the music and if a band does it great it brings it to another level and you know someone said well you don't have Beatlemania you don't have Rain you don't have the Fab Four you don't have, I, I don't want to leave out anybody Living Led you know uh, there's so, so many, many Liverpool legends there's so many great top of the line Beatle bands but you know I'm a, let's compare it to I'm a horror guy I don't have to see The Exorcist or Psycho to love a horror movie because because right. if it's a horror movie, it's going to be great. If a band is doing Beatles songs, it's going to be great because it's Beatles songs. Yeah. So that's how I feel. Whereas if you go see one of those bands, you're getting no doubt the best quality show, blah, blah, blah. Here you're getting quantity and you're getting a mix of it. You're getting a taste of this, a taste of that, a female lead singer band, a band with six, a band with three, a band with a ukulele lead. You know, it's a really nice uh, potpourri uh, of different uh, Beatles styles and it's going to be special. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I, 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 if you don't have anything more to say about that, uh, I guess we could do like a, just a wrap up and just uh, recap everything we've already said. So uh, mention the books again and um, promote the Fab Four Music Festival one more time and we'll sign off. I sure will because it's hard to get me to promote and I appreciate that. I know, that. I have to pull it out of this guy. <laughs> the first, first book that came out during the pandemic the book of top 10 horror lists where a hundred celebrities gave me their favorite horror themed lists uh, still available from Bear Manor Media on Amazon or from the website www book of top 10 the number 10 horrorlists.com. If you get it through the website, you can get a signed copy from moi with the blurred fingers. <laughs> Second book, the follow-up, which we're promoting right now, which just came out. It just came out this month. It's True Ghost Stories of Connecticut. And the website is www.paranormalconnecticut.com. I don't know how to spell paranormal or Connecticut. So hopefully you can That's figure right, that out. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> or, or there you go. Or oh, get it sir. from- there you uh, go. Paranormal. <laughs> And if you don't need uh, if you don't need the uh, signed copy, you can get that on Amazon. And then coming up Saturday, August sixth, please join me and hundreds, maybe thousands of Beatle fans plus ten bands. You know what it is? It's ten bands, vendors, food, beverages, and you equals one beautiful day <laughs> in Simsbury, Connecticut at the Simsbury Performing Arts Center, www.fab4, the number four, fab4musicfestival.com, hosted by Charles Rosnay and Mark Arnold will be there in spirit. Yes, and I will be there uh, physically one of these years, probably next year at the earliest. I, I need to go back there again. The last time I was in your area was in 2009 I went to New York and Massachusetts and Connecticut and Rhode Island. And I did go to Derby, but I wasn't looking for ghosts. I was looking for the the remnants of the Charlton Comics building because that's where they used to publish. Of course. <laughs> Charlton Comics was published in Derby. Um, uh, uh, original, what's the, um, and sometimes I feel like that. Sometimes I don't. I'm oh. enjoy and oh, Peter Paul Candies was there. <laughs> Paul Candies was Naugatuck, which is part of that Connecticut Triangle, the Valley. Uh, so yeah, and what's still there is um, the Wiffle Ball uh, uh, 
company. That's still there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you got everything back there. I gotta go. <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot that Charlton, I grew up, you know, in New Haven. Now I'm in Orange, which is close to Derby. And uh, I never thought as a kid, mom, dad, take me to the Charlton building. Maybe they have, you know, samples of comics. I never thought of that because I was such a big DC and a Marvel guy. And yeah. Charlton was always, you know, that, that you know, second string comic book that I never would have thought to go there. It was so close to me. Wow. For me, I was always like interested in them because I always thought that's the oddball company back then. Now there's yeah. comic publishers all over the, the world. But, you know, yeah. At the time, they're all in New York, except for Charlton. And Charlton didn't publish on the same printing presses. They had their own, you know, and it's like, what is wrong with these people? <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, you know, they had a good run. They they published song hits and where you get to read lyrics and other things, it's not just Hit Parader. Not, yeah, all that stuff. So you they, know, were, they were a big Beatles company because of Hit yep. Parader. Sure. Exactly. Song hits, Hit Parader. So, yeah, anyway. uh, endless stuff. <laughs> So not to go on to a big tangent, but once you said Derby, I go, bing, you know, Charles. Right. <laughs> anyway. Well done, well done, well done. All right. Um, well, uh, I guess that wraps it up for another episode. This is a Fun Ideas special podcast, and I'll put it up shortly. We'll talk after we're off. And uh, this is Mark Arnold and Charles F. Rosney signing off. <laughs>